to my homework. Um, <laughs> so uh, iCloud decided to delete my presentation. So um, there's a few examples in here that if they don't look quite right, I'm not an idiot. It's just having to do this for four hours is really difficult. Um, but I want to talk to you about uh, ES6 and in particular proxies. Um, as we know, it's my uh, Twitter handle there. I love abuse, but send it. Uh, you'll get some back. <laughs> um, I'm used to it because I work in the lab Bible, so I kind of get used to some of the live Bible labs, GS, and stuff like that. Uh, it's not like that at all. Um, I'm in charge of three teams, and we work across uh, our website, uh, mobile apps, internal tools uh, for understanding how content is sourced and video um, gets processed. We get about 4,000 submissions a day, and we've got to figure out does this have dicks in it, and can we put it out onto our channels? <laughs> so uh, we have a team of people that uh, kind of use machine learning and vision uh, processing to try to figure this out. If you guys have ever seen the Silicon Valley episode with uh, hot dogs, yes, that is a guy in my office that uh, had to do that. Um, and there are some really weird shaped hot dogs. <laughs> uh, if you are not adverse to hot dogs and you uh, love React, we look GraphQL, uh, we are hiring a number of different roles, we're about 10 open at the moment, uh, just to finish afterwards. Um, to really kind of understand what proxies are, we probably need to have a little bit of a primer about metaprogramming. Uh, this sounds like a really obnoxious kind of like meta programming, um, but there's kind of two levels of programming. So most of us kind of deal with base level. This is the application code. This is the runtime, uh, and then there's another level which is metadata. So if any of you guys have ever used eval, where you can take a string function and then execute that in runtime, this is a meta programming at work. But there's also kind of free traits. So there's introspection. Um, so it's kind of quite useful having a talk right after GraphQL. So introspection is very similar to what we've just seen where you can take a look at the schema and actually ask questions about it. What are the properties of this object? Is that string? Is that integer? Uh, but it only gives you real access. Then there's self-modification. So this is the ability to change that structure. So that's that eval example I just gave. And then the third one, which is really what kind of makes proxies um, actually you know, work and is available, is uh, intercession. So this is the ability to intercept requests to an object, a function, a property, and they can go, whoa, hold on a second, I want to kind of check a few things, you know, merge you around in the hood, and then decide what we're going to do with that. So, it's kind of a three parts of the uh, proxy, so there's a handler. So this is the thing that actually contains what's called a trap. Uh, these are just properties that are quite common to any kind of object that you would proxy, and they're uh, what can be intercepted, and you can provide custom logic or um, provide kind of like further understanding to what that actually does. Uh, then the trap themselves, so there's a long list of those on the next slide, and target, so this is what you, you kind of want to apply this proxy to. You know, so if anyone, oh, this is a stupid question, anyone familiar with React? None of you? Okay, it's going to not go well. Um, so high order composition is kind of a big thing in React, particularly for Redux. Uh, so, proxies are like to create a almost high order composition over a property. So, we've got a kind of a long list of different kind of methods we've got. Uh, please never use this. <laughs> just don't. Uh, if you do, um, there's a circle of hell just specifically for you, which you can set yourself. Um, but the typical ones are kind of. <laughs> Come on, Apple. Uh, so the typical ones are kind of has, get, and set. Uh, so these are the ones we'll be talking most about today. Uh, there's also kind of apply and own keys. So there's a couple of use cases. Now, everyone's probably kind of familiar with immutability and immutability JS. Uh, it's probably one of the largest libraries in existence, um, just for making sure that you don't do stupid shit. Um, <laughs> there's uh, caching, uh, validation. Uh, validation is probably uh, an interesting one because I know no one that actually goes, fuck, I love a bit of validation. <laughs> Give me that form, I cannot wait to check that. It's <laughs> fine. Like, oh, yes, it's amazing. Um, and then conditional execution, so that's a really cool thing that uh, Apple ate. And I did not have time to recreate, but I will try to talk about that in a little bit. But first, we're going to talk about immutability. So, if you can take a look at uh, this really fancy tree, uh, which the UX team 
did not appreciate me asking them to draw. Um, it's just crayons, I thought they would be quite happy to do that. But one minute to describe. So imagine we've got a property, uh, sorry, an object with a couple of properties. And you want to request the name. And it's going to return a string. So what you can do is you can then intercept that request. So this circle here represents that property, so that will wrap around that property and go, hold on, we'll do something. And take a look at this uh, code here. So this is kind of how you lay out an initial property. Uh, sorry, proxy on your properties. So you've got get, has, and keys, so on and so forth. Uh, don't worry about this code at the back. We'll kind of go through each bit. This is really just to kind of illustrate that all of this code together is enough to give you immutability. Remember, I said 13,000 files, largest code base, just to make sure you don't do stupid shit. Uh, I fitted it on one single slide. <laughs> Fuck you, Facebook. So, access and name. But then I also want to know a little bit more about names, so I want to know, are you a string? And then I want to go, okay, I want to change you because um, I want you to change my name, Jeffrey's person. And uh, then you can follow this back and back and back. So, how do we do this? This function here starts. So, whenever we touch one of those events, we need to find out where it is. So, alongside of our object, we can create something called state. This might be familiar to people who use Redux. What we do is we store a copy of the initial object alongside the base. The base is the original. So we could have an empty object, for example, and then the copy could be an addition of that thing. So, I love analogies. So we're going to do a git one. So we've initialized our project, and we have a file, so this is our property. Uh, we've made a few changes. Um, we want to access that property, so we check its state. We want to know how you've been touching on. Are you modified? If you are modified, we want to make sure that the change we're making isn't the same. <coughs> so we don't want to continue to write over the same fields. If not, then we want to create a proxy because you should never touch the raw value. It has to be a proxy of that in order to gate it. If I haven't been modified, I want to check to make sure it's proxyable first. So as the symbols uh, are a side effect of proxies, you cannot kind of proxy a proxy, which makes sense. So we've modified our property. So now we've got a new kind of point in time on our git tree. So I've updated now. And in order to do that, I check to make sure I'm modified because I don't want to actually make changes on an object that I don't have access to because this is immutability. So I kind of make sure that those properties exist here. And then I mark that it's changed. So you remember in the previous diagram, we had those little red dots. That's what I'm doing now, marking that change right there. And then I'm assigning my new value to the copy, not the base. So now I've now got a completely separate branch. So this is, if you check out a massive creative feature branch, for example. And then we carry that work out on a draft. So the mark change, what does that do? So we check to make sure that we're not already modified. We then set it to modified and we do a shallow copy. The reason why we're going to do a shallow copy is because we're going to take the whole tree because we've only got a finite amount of memory. And imagine if you've got an entire application full of different clones uh, that touch you know, single name properties, stuff like that. Uh, we want to be really kind of preserved for our memory usage. We then assign the copy state over into our proxy. So what we actually turn around and say is, right, you now handle this change. I don't want anything to do with it. You handle this change. And we, all, we want to also make sure that uh, we're not in a nested tree. So if we're of the parent, then we want to mark the change on the parent as well. And that means that if we're two properties in, so going back to graphical example, uh, query ball, so I've got a number of different moves, and I'm only wanting to change the type of one move in that array, I need to mark the rest of the tree as modified. Otherwise we get into a bit of a predicament state, get set into disarray. So that's kind of this point here. So we've applied the modified state. So back to our Git analogy, I'm now ready to introduce this back into the main branch. So this is what we know as finalize. So I've taken the copy and I'm taking its state. This is the new state that I've created. And for each of the properties, I want to finalize. So we kind of use a little bit of recursion here. They do from another tree. And then we want to use this method here, freeze. So object freeze essentially makes sure that any object within JavaScript uh, cannot have any properties changed. So when I said do not use set prototype, I mean don't touch that shit. 
Um, but what that does there is just make sure that even if you did you to get a massive message saying you're an idiot, don't do that. So this is now our Git tree. So we've now kind of fit a new repo, made a change, copied that change over, committed it, and then moved it back. So now we've actually established immutability. Another great example is this. Uh, do check this repo out. Uh, this is the smallest uh, kind of immutable library that I've ever seen. It actually uses proxies. It does have an uh, ES5 fallback as well. So we will work in um, retarded browsers like IE. Uh, so this is kind of a really good illustration. So this is our co uh, completed document. We've then made some changes. So I've added a header, a footer, maybe we removed a paragraph, and then we've created some entirely new. So this current version here, this draft, still exists somewhere. Unless you're Apple, then you lose keynote spreadsheets. Okay. So that's immutability. Our next example is going to be uh, validation. So just a quick iteration about what I mean by validation. So that's checking field types, their values, and their computed output. So I can create um, a function that may take a password and then I want to kind of extract rate. I don't know how complex that is based on a certain number of criteria. This function here, proxy validator, uh, it takes a schema. Uh, I'll show you the schema next on the next slide. And it also takes a sanitizer. So dealing with the uh, users, users are stupid, they're going to try to put date births in password fields, all that kind of stuff. Uh, what we do is we have our little set method here, and what we're going to do is we take the object, the proxy, the value, we're going to run it through the sanitizer, and make sure that there's nothing nasty in there, and then we're going to apply that to our value. Based off that, we then want to check our rules and make sure that it conforms to what's been given to it. All of this in the middle here uh, isn't a kind of like proxy exclusive thing, it's more a case of just demonstrating what this set can actually do. And if I wanted to, I could actually throw a validation over at this point and say, no, this is not a suitable value. Uh, you cannot write it to the pro uh, property. And then lastly, we can return this function here, which takes the handler and the target. So remember I said the handler is the thing that intercepts your request. It goes, well, this is what I'm going to do with this function. And the target is what I guess applied to. And then we create a new proxy here for those two together. So validated, pretty straightforward, uh, got a name, we'll check its length, has to be a minimum of six characters, uh, otherwise we provide this message, and is uppercase, so we want to make sure that the value starts with our uppercase letter. Sanitizer, so we want to trim it, so if it's longer than it needs to be, then we want to trim that. If it's an email, then we want to normalize it, and we want to make sure it's all lowercase. This doesn't have to be attributed to one value, Name and email are different properties on my project. So, as soon as it resolves, they can uh, provide each of these different values. So, we're going to run this. So, we're going to create an instance of this proxy validator, we're passing the validators and the sanitizer into that. We're then going to create this object here, and we're going to modify its name. So, those of you who can count should know that JSON does not have six characters, so we get a nice little one in here. There's another really cool thing you can do as well. So let's say that that field uh, there was a password and someone hasn't provided the correct length, but it's not strong enough for a suitable password. What we can also do is what's known as a proxy revoke. So you can actually take away permission from the user to touch that object again. You know, like I say in the immutability example, we want to make sure that the integrity of our object is pristine. So what we can do instead is we can use this proxy revoke and what this does is this adds a, a function, which means that in this example here, I can call this method, and that means the next time around someone attempts to try to touch this object, it will fail, it will throw an error. It will say, sorry, you cannot do that. This object is now being wasted. Uh, you can always kind of recreate it. In the mutability example, you can clone it, but you should never be able to touch the old example again. This is um, probably why if you go to do some websites you put user and password in and um, I don't know what you guys might have heard in the news but marketing company was actually sniffing fields and was tricking your password manager into thinking 
that its field was a password and they were scooping passwords. So this kind of approach here would actually stop that. It would be impossible to do that because they would actually turn around to the browser and say, I'm sorry, but you cannot get this property anymore. No. Validation failed. So to summarize, a uh, proxy is an intercession. It acts as a gate between the middle object and the caller. So that means you can actually put a um, really cool kind of middleware so in the middle of that. It can be as simple as complex as you like. It can even be asynchronous if you want to use async await functions. Uh, you're going to remember that every time that you create one of these kind of interactions, if you're you know, going off to the network and it takes two seconds or so to come back, that's going to block the UI. So it's still that kind of thing to bear in mind. Um, it simplifies most boilerplate code, and if you really want to see um, some really great examples, uh, this repository here um, by a guy called Gershop Got, I really hope I can spell that right, um, and then top, top 10 kind of use cases, so this kind of inspired most of this talk. Um, is there any questions? You have the validation error objects, those little schemes, is that just code that you've got elsewhere or is that part of the actual proxy? Uh, it's just it's my code. So, uh, if we just quickly go back. So, all of this code here uh, is just what I wrote. Right, right. So, so you're, you're, you're defining that validation error yeah. elsewhere, it's not part of it. Exactly, yeah. So, it's just an example that whenever you try to set a property, you can apply some validation first. And if you don't pass the validation, then it doesn't set that value. So, this call of immutability will actually make a uh, a really great form, particularly for it. Yeah. So you guys use this at the moment? Uh, yeah. What are you using? Uh, making sure our writers don't use shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so a lot, a lot of what we try to do um, is really just kind of like save time. Uh, so a lot of the errors that we found when we about a year ago was just down to menial tasks, such as this. Like most people don't really want to do form validation, but you start talking about root really cool stuff like this, and suddenly people peek up and go, oh, yeah, that's cool, I'll do that. Um, and then other areas is really just around security, so we, we do have uh, quite a lot of user personal data to do in our submissions licensing system, so it's just making sure that um, no one can act as a bad actor in the code interact with that. Wow, the game off easy. I should have done a graphic on top. <laughs> <laughs>